Why? Why is saying something true important as opposed to just saying something that sounds cool or is interesting or is thought provoking? Why would you put truth ahead of any of those things? So much of the trouble in writing is this, this vicious self-recrimination cycle where you write, you know, the blue sky and you say, oh, I suck. I drove into a parking lot today. I was at, uh, down in San Diego. I went to Mysterious Galaxy. I went to go sign books. I drive into the parking lot. I park at a parking spot. Oh, blue sky? What are you thinking? This poor woman, lovely human being, maybe 70 years old, this is her job. She goes up to me, tries to catch me. I'm walking away. Who are you? What do you want? Why are you talking to me? Sure, you seem nice, but I kind of got to go. And this is really why it took me so long to write my first book. She's like, you cannot park there. That is only parking for the bank. When you're polishing things to a high gloss, you're at the, at the stage where you're figuring out the big structure of your book and testing things. I said, really? Because there's no signs anywhere that say parking for the bank. It looks like it's part of this parking lot, right? You're losing time kind of coming and going because mm -hmm. it takes forever to get it so perfect. She goes, no, 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 no. There's signs there and there's signs there. I said, right, right, right. They, I, and I parked here. And then it's so perfect, you can't throw it in the trash. She said, no, 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 there are signs. I said, there are not signs for where I parked. We just established this, right? There's signs there. There's signs there. There's no sign here. She said, no, 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 there's signs. And then you're trying to do these weird gymnastics to keep the beautiful scene where the brother cries, but the brother shouldn't be in this book. And I thought, this is a metaphor for how you do not want to live your life, at least how I do not want to live my life, is to go around saying, there's a parking sign here. Everybody should know not to park here when there is no parking sign. You know, if, if it's giving you trouble, skip it. It's very important to think honestly about what you want out of this. What kind of a writer do you want to be? What is most important to you? I think there's a paradox in there because most of us are novelists or screenwriters who write fiction, and yet we still want to say something true. I do, at least. I only want to say things that are true. If you want to make a living, there are ways to do that. The people that are most successful at it are people that can write multiple books in a year. Don't fuss with the language. Don't do anything. Just get it down. I had the seed of an idea that eventually became my first book, Come Sunday. And it came at the end of a really bad day, in the middle of a really bad time in my life. That's not the kind of writer that I am. Even if I wanted to do that, it's outside of my particular skill set, but you can do that. And you can start to lay in the big structural pieces of your book without spending months, if not years, polishing them. My husband and I had been married 10 years and he had just had a traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. um, so he was convalescing and I didn't know if I was ever gonna get back the man that I had married. And our infant daughter had just been born. If the most important thing to you is writing exactly the book that you want to write. Realize you may or may not get commercial acceptance with that. So that night I went to bed and I was feeling very sorry for myself. And, uh, and it, it, this storm is just relentless out my window. And all of a sudden I had this vision. But again, it's your time, it's your work, it's your life. You get to decide what your priorities are and what's the most meaningful thing to you. This woman appeared next to my bed and she was holding a funeral announcement and this awareness came to me that she had lost a child in a traumatic car accident. I've never been in a bad car accident. I have had multiple corneal injuries and I have also uh, had my, I have seizures sometimes and I, I faint a lot so I've been unconscious probably more than most people. And there was something so compelling about her, but then immediately the scene shifted and she was in this rondavel. I have a fairly high rate of unconsciousness in my life, sort of like Philip Marlowe, it's the one thing I have in common with him. In South Africa, it's those round huts, you know, that you see out on the African countryside. So I could be extremely accurate about what it's like to wake up with a corneal injury. Some time had passed and there was a little African boy that came to the doorway and I heard him ask her for help. And she paused and she said, no, not today, but come back tomorrow. 
I could be 100%, 1,000% true about the experience of waking up with a corneal injury. I could be very, very accurate about what it's like to wake up from a seizure or unconsciousness and not quite know where you are, who you are, and have a little moment of amnesia. It's very frightening. And there was such promise in that statement. And I turned to my husband and I woke him up and I told him what I just told you and he said three magical words. But I've never been in a car accident but I was able to find the truth in that experience through taking my truth and putting it in there. Write it down. And that brings me to my other favorite move and this is a journalism thing. Um, it's use TKs. I didn't want to tell anybody what I was doing so I wrote in secret. So it's this fun thing in journalism when you get back marks from the proofreader, you think, is the proofreader semi-literate? Because they misspelled everything. I literally wrote in a closet. I moved my husband's shirts out the way and I moved my little desk in there and, and nobody besides my husband knew what I was doing. I didn't discuss it with him. He never read one sentence. They misspell everything so that it's obvious it's not a real uh, copy to go into the final product. So they spell to come, TK. Part of the reason was I didn't want people coming up to me while I'm in the midst of this curious journey and saying, so, when are we going to see your book on the New York Times bestseller list, you know, or have they made a movie yet? And this is this move that saves me so much time because... I, I wanted to have permission to fail. I think that's the greatest gift that I gave for myself and I try to do that with every project. If you're trying to, you've just taken your walk and you have your beautiful scene that's unspooled in your mind and you're just gonna write it all down and then check out if it's any good later and then you say, what's the perfect name for a bad guy? Once I had finished a manuscript, it took me about two and a half years, then I had to figure out how to get an agent. And then it's 45 minutes later, and then you're hungry, and then you have to go someplace else. So just put bad guy TK. November 5th, 2007, 11.17 a.m. I got a letter, email, from this agent. Here's another example. Most people have experienced rejection of some kind, and that rejection hurts. Rejection is a universal pain. Everyone has felt rejection at some point in their life. I assume everyone in this room has felt it at some point in their life. And yet we've all experienced it in an entirely different way. If you ever need a lesson in humility, <laughs> you guys are writers, so I guess it doesn't apply. But if you do, all you need to do is go on the internet and look up how to get published. Dear Matt, thank you for your patience on this. Exclamation point. All right. We all know what that moment feels like when you realize they don't like you back. They don't want your book. They don't want to spend time with you. And yet none of us were in the same situation with it. I remember the original sample, and I must say you've made some terrific improvements. Exclamation point. Two out of two. One source that I said, uh, read said, if, if you haven't had 60 rejections yet to your query letter for your agent, you haven't even started to play the game yet. And then I got an email. Uh, I'd almost forgotten I had the partial out. And it was from my friend Genevieve. And she said, uh, oh, my friend checked this out. And I was like, great, I can you know, show it to a junior agent, get over some of the nervousness of that. I think for me, the story is a bit too melodramatic. Hmm. And that's why I'm proposing we blow up the internet. <laughs> <laughs> there are familiar elements, mysterious women in peril, scary thugs, stony detectives. Which is not a bad thing, but I can never forget that I'm in a noir thriller. It isn't real, not even for a second. No exclamation point. She said, and then he showed it to his boss, who is John Grisham's agent. And I said, oh my god, I would have proofed it again. So nevertheless, in the face of gloomy statistics, I mean, are they ever not gloomy? I don't know if statistics ever work in our favor, but I spent one entire summer two and a half months, writing a three-paragraph query letter. For many, a good story is all it takes. Right now, I'm looking for a work that says something about our world that uses fiction, in other words, to tell the truth. I think crime fiction is appealing on a lot of levels because, as I mentioned, you, it is a really great vehicle for dealing with social issues. So for me, it's a pass. Keep writing and submitting, exclamation point. You will get there.
which interest me. Yeah, I think the detective novel is a metaphor for our whole culture and that's one thing that, you know, appeals to me about it, one thing that I have written about a lot. It turned out to be more difficult than writing a 380 page novel. And they said it was great. Yeah. And it was a moment where I had to decide whether I should really pursue this or not. So that was my first full rejection email and or uh, first full manuscript uh, a rejection. That was the first feedback from any professional I'd gotten on my writing. And uh, lived off savings for a couple years. I crafted a list of top 10 dream agents. So let's just get those people out of the way. I was going to get married soon. And uh, I finished that book. And it wasn't, it wasn't good enough. And I mailed them off. One was an e-query. I thought, well, well, we'll wait three or four months. I don't think I've been called a liar in any other rejections because remember, I didn't believe, it isn't real, not even for a second. So not only was I rejected, I was a liar. I do think that is a metaphor for not just our culture, but on a deeper level, the sort of nature of being a human being is that shit doesn't make a whole lot of sense out there and you realize it more as you get older that, you know. But uh, in truth, she was probably right because the book wasn't ready then. You know, in crime fiction, there's usually a nice little closure. You get the kind of justice that you don't often get in real life. And I think people really like that. It was good because if I'd gotten um, an agent at that point and somehow they would have um, gotten this book published, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd had one book published because it wasn't good enough. Two days later, I got a call from Emma Sweeney in New York. At the time, she was having a lot of success with her best-selling author, Sarah Gruen, who wrote Water for Elephants. I didn't know at the time. I thought, you know, she's an idiot. You know, because my dad liked it. My books tend to be a little bit more open-ended, but it, it's just a genre that inherently deals with what to me are really interesting issues. It was the book I had been working on for six years, and I had learned the hard way everything I shouldn't do. And she introduced herself, and she said all sorts of nice things about Come Sunday, and she said, I want to be your agent. I know exactly how to sell this book. But that book, you know, just the fact that it had a solid beginning, I could talk to these people. And an agent saw potential and decided to work with me on a few ideas. You know, it's not the bad people who get struck by lightning and die young. It's not the good guys who rise to the top. Sometimes it is, of course. I'm saying there are no rules. It's kind of silly to make total separations between genre and literary. There's books that straddle both of those. There are some awfully great writers working or who have worked in crime fiction and you could put their book on either shelf and it would be at home there. And uh, the next book came together in nine months and became my first published book called The 500. And in the years of being a published author since then, and that's eight years I guess, um, that remains the highlight. It beats hands down publication day. The truth is a very confusing thing. We try to make order out of it, but we still the fundamental nature of life is we don't have answers. We don't know what's coming next. We don't know what came before. We don't even know what's going to come in 10 minutes, you know? So I do think this sort of metaphor of the detective resonates with all of us because we all wish we knew more than we did. I do, at least.